All right. I'm so glad to finally be able to discuss on Bad Faith Podcast today the ongoing conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo with two guests who are joining me on this illustrious panel. I know you both have your own discrete areas of expertise, and I hope to cover a wide range of topics today. So how about you introduce yourself, starting with you, Jason? Thank you, and thank you for this invitation. It's a, um, it's a pleasure. I often enjoy listening to you, so it's nice being here to talk to you. Um, I have a whole different, uh, have different hats. So I guess my main hat is I'm an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I'm also the director of the Congo Research Group, which is a research institute based at New York University. And then um, both Christoph and I are actually uh, founding members of a research institute based in Kinshasa called Ebuteli. So those are my various hats. Okay, wonderful. And what are all of your hats, Christoph? I don't have many hats. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to to be with you tonight. Um, my name is Christoph. I'm a researcher. I'm originally from France and Germany, and um, I've been working on different aspects uh, of of conflict and, and politics in, in Central Africa, especially Eastern Congo for um, around 15 years now, and uh, currently uh, with Ghent University, which is in Belgium. All right. So I think if the listeners are anything like I am, we've been really immersed in discussing, covering, tweeting about, writing about the ongoing conflict in Gaza. And one of the types of pushback that we frequently get if you exist in an online left space is, what about the other conflicts? And I think that that is offered oftentimes in bad faith by folks who would prefer that we not discuss what's going on in Gaza. But there is also a reality that there are um, asymmetries in political coverage for various reasons. Um, with respect to various conflicts happening around the world at any given moment. And I have a sincere desire to have a better understanding of what is going on in the Congo and how we could have gotten to a place where the death toll is in the millions without there being more global attention to what's going on. So I know this is going to sound perhaps like an overly simplistic or basic place to start, but I wonder if uh, one of you, perhaps you, Jason, can go to what you would describe of as the kind of historical historical um, or material beginning of the current present iteration of the conflict. I'm glad you said present because I was about to say 18 in 1885. <laughs> well, I mean, if, the... it, if that's what it takes, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate a little historical background yeah. if you think it's necessary to really understand what's going on. I think that, that, that I'm not going to go to 1885. I do think it's important for listeners to understand that the origin, I mean, the origins, the deep roots origins of the Congo crisis do go that far back in the sense that it had, um, it was one of the only colonies in the world to have been founded as a private fiefdom of a king. So for the first decades of his existence, the Congo Free State was uh, a private business venture of the Belgian king. And then then she was handed over to the Belgian government and then colonized um, for 52 years by the Belgian government. And, you know, that seems like a long time ago for us. But it's kind of like telling African-Americans that uh, Jim Crow was a long time ago because it's the same thing, right? It's 1960 independence in the Congo. Um, and so I think that as far back as that goes for some people, it, it really is extremely important as a context of the current moment. And then, of course, independence in the Congo with the first prime minister of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba, assassinated with the complicity of American and Belgian and British intelligence services and then Mobutu then reigned for 32 years as a strong man, um, eventually undermining his own state and institutions and creating the conditions for the current mess. And that he did so with the backing of numerous powers, but especially the United States as, as part of the Cold War logic. So I think that deep historical context is is important, although I don't think we need to probably discuss it much more. I'm happy to if you, if you want to. Then uh, I think more recently in 1996, when the serious fighting began, the serious wars began initially as a war um, to get rid of Mobutu Sese Seko. And it was a regional war. It wasn't a civil war. It was a regional war, a coalition of different countries to throw him out um, because he'd become an embarrassment, but also because his state 
then Zaire was hosting, uh, you know, a dozen different rebel groups from neighboring countries and become, therefore, a thorn in the side of many neighboring countries, especially the Rwandan government, because the people who had perpetrated the genocide in 1994 fled into eastern Congo and continued their attacks into Rwanda from the eastern Congo. For all of these reasons, the first, the first, the, the beginning of this current conflict really was in the fall of 1996, when that regional coalition came together to throw, overthrow Mobutu, kicked him out, installed somebody who then fell out with many of those allies, started the Second Great Congo War that came to an end in 2003. And then the end of that big Great Second Congo War in 2003 brought about the, the current Third Republic with the current constitution uh, and the first, the first democratic uh, uh, republic since the independence period. Um, that sort of ushered into the period that we're in now. And since, so since the end of the Great Congo Wars, as they're called, 1996 to 2003, in theory, we're in a post-conflict period in the Congo. But I think the reality for many Congolese in the East is that the conflict never ended. And in fact, if you look at displacement figures, today you have 7 million people displaced in the Eastern DRC. That is twice as many as at the height of the quote-unquote real wars even though both the Congolese government as, as well as much of the international community treats this as an internal low-grade conflict and not an all-out civil war. And so I think that perhaps that sort of sets, I mean, I can go into much more detail, but that sort of sets the stage where at the moment we have 7 million displaced in the Eastern DRC. We have around 100 different armed groups. Christophe knows them better than, than I do. Um, we have interlocking conflicts. We have neighboring countries that continue to support and back armed groups in the Eastern DRC, especially the Rwandan government, but not only. And we have a Congolese government that seems either complicit or apathetic in terms of reestablishing security in the Eastern, Eastern DRC. So in an effort to untangle some of that, because I do, I do sort of feel like having a better grasp of the historical antecedents helps people to understand and really kind of invest in what's going on today. And I do feel like sometimes being able to latch on to kind of a, <laughs> a good guy, for lack of a better word, helps people to kind of be able to parse through all of the names and movements and changes of power that end up happening. I do think that that seems to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, kind of difficult to nail down if we're defining good guy as a kind of an uncorrupt party that is acting in the best interest of the people, at least unless you go unless you go back as far as Patrice Lumumba. And so I don't I don't know. Does that does that feel <laughs> does that feel sort of accurate to, to you or am I missing some nuance there as someone who admittedly is only trying uh, not just now accessing kind of um a very baseline, a very superficial history of the region. I don't know. I'd be interested to hear what, what Christoph thinks about this. But I mean, I don't think that the perspective of trying to identify good guys and bad guys gets us very far here. Even Patrice Lubumba is Tell me you know, why. Hail, hailed across the world as an independence hero. But he's in the Congo himself, he's sometimes controversial, in certain, certainly in certain areas. He was only in power for three months. Mm -hmm. uh, and then removed. So he you know, has a three-month track record to judge him on. Um, but even since then, I think that, you know, the most good guys you can find, I think, in you know, the beauty of the Congo, and this I, this I think really is needs to be emphasized, is its pluralism. It's a plural society. Mm -hmm. It is an effervescent society. It's a society with many, many outrageous, wonderful, boisterous, annoying voices. That, for me, is the hero. That's not one person, right? It has an, a very vibrant civil society, beautiful cultural and art scene. It has many voices, many creative voices, wonderful voices. But to try to uplift one of them to say, this guy, here's the hero, or here's the party. That is, I think, usually got us into troubled waters in the DRC. Mm -hmm. And I think similarly, just to say there is one, um, you know, there is one bad guy in, in a similar way. And I think we've seen the international community try to do this, try to find mm -hmm. one hero, one person, uplift them and say, here's the providential figure. They will take us to salvation. That's not going to work out. Instead, what you have seen, I think, are systems or parts of society that works. This grassroots effervescence that able to holds people in check. That, I think, is much more successful than just trying to uplift one person. Doing that has usually got us into trouble, I think, in the past. But I, I don't know. Christoph may have other views on this. 
But Christoph, yes, what what do you make of how do you start to make sense of the shifting power dynamics here as you as you reflect on the the recent history, the last sixty years or so of history here? Well, I think there's there's a lot of things coming together. Um, so, um, so if obviously, as Jason described, you've got this this history of now thirty years of more or less intensively um, um, ongoing conflict. Um, there is um, there is good grounds to ask the question why um, why um, people, especially internationally, have um, sort of. Um, May 2003, the official end of of the Congo Wars. I mean, it's true there were a number of um, of uh, rather high profile peace agreements and so on and so forth. But um, if you if you ask um, the population of Eastern Congo, for instance, whether their lives have become much safer ever since, um, I'm not sure if, if if many people would would respond with yes. Um, and um, so, in the end, it is a kind of self-perpetuating logic of um, of unsolved issues, unsolved grievances, and new issues that uh, that come on top of this, this uh, as in many other conflicts in the world as well. Um, now, um, perhaps um, as opposed to um, two other wars, we have um, in Eastern Congo not only 30 years of recent history, um, um, Marked by 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 active hostilities and by 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 direct violence against uh, um, against uh, civilian populations, but you've got as well um, these long-standing historical colonial and post-colonial roots. So if we talk today about something like um, which is actually in 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 many mainstream uh, Western media, which is something. Uh, that tends to be sort of a go-to um, aspect of the conflict to highlight so-called ethnic tensions. Um, mm. Now, ethnic tensions are often seen, uh, especially by Westerners, especially by white people, as something uh, very primordial, something um, that is inherent to non-white societies that uh, so-called Western civilization has sort of um, long gone beyond. Um, but if you dig a little bit into history, you will you will see that in in many cases where we see today um, instances of conflict of violence in a place like Eastern Congo, the 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 seeds of that have been sown um, more often than not by um, by uh, colonial powers. Um, and uh, one good example here is um, is the the ways. Uh, um, in which customary power, customary governance is managed, which is something that is um, generally quite relevant in society in Congo. So people do believe in the idea that um, they form a community and they have a leader and uh, and lots of that is managed through um, to heritage. So, so um, leaders are, are inheriting power um, um, through lineage to genealogies uh, but many of those genealogies have been completely usurped by by colonial powers um, mainly because a lot of the uh, of the chiefs and leaders at the time actually rebelled against colonial imposition and so what uh, what uh, colonial powers did was basically trying to wipe out all the leaders that uh, that contested um, colonization and replace them by by sometimes very random people there is uh, uh just to give one example there's one um uh customary chieftaincy that that still exists today that is led by um by the grand or grand grandchildren of a guy that happened to be um just a translator for colonial powers um as they arrived um uh, over 100 years ago um and so that sort of little bit contextualizes and shows also that many of today's conflicts um as much as they have certainly erupted in a certain moment of time that is not 100% directly connected to some nitty gritty event from 100 years ago, there are those lines of connections and, 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 and they're very important in the ways also in which Congolese people sort of see themselves in, in, in these larger conflicts. I mean, one of the lines of connection seems to be the battle over resources and who has access to them. My cursory review seemed to suggest, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, that um, part of the post-independence um, uh, uh, 
struggle was that despite there being independence, there was still a lot of colonial ownership of resources. It wasn't being distributed to the people, and that created tension around um, current leadership. There was some question as to whether or not um, uh, there was going to be a, an alignment with the West or whether the UN would intervene to help uh, settle kind of rising tensions in the country. And when there was a, uh, when the West declined to intervene, looking to the East and to the Soviet Union, which then created a Western investment in toppling um, Patricia Lumumba for even considering making an alliance with a Soviet power. So we get this Cold War context playing out in Central Africa. And it seems today the conflict largely and, and the kind of unsettling, the the failure to be able to settle upon um, leadership and control is largely related to the growing importance of um, technological resources, cobalt in particular, that are concentrated in the Congo. So can you help us untease some of that? Yeah, that's, um, the resource question is probably one of the most tricky aspects uh, because um, it is one of those things that are at the same time true and not true. Um, I'll start with cobalt, which is a bit sort of the um, the mineral of the hour in a way, uh, given given a sort of broader global technological uh, evolution. Um, so first of all, Congo is the, the the currently the the biggest producer, at least uh, in terms of uh, of export value um, of cobalt, and and that for for a number of years now, and it's also considered to be um, harboring some of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, known reserves. Um, and that's a little bit similar also to copper, which is perhaps um, gets slowly out of fashion, but was um, for many, many years, um, I guess, through the since independence uh, throughout uh, into the 90s or 2000s, um, also Congo's most, uh, most valuable um, export resource. Um, one interesting aspect is that um, those minerals are not intimately connected with violence in in the eastern part. Uh, most of the reservoirs for cobalt, as much as for copper, um, are in uh, in the southeast of Congo. Um, at some point um, during the sort of the so-called Great Wars, when there was a lot of involvement of uh, literally all neighboring countries, um, that played a bit of a role. Um, but um, it. Uh, you got to see this um, more in the context of, of Congo's global relations and, and the way in which Congo works um, as a nation amongst others, as well as in, in broader political governance that goes far beyond uh, just uh, the um, conflict and, and violence affected areas. Um, and there, there is a there is two clear points, perhaps uh, one external one and one internal one. Um, the first being that um, in parts due to um, Congo's colonization and the way it, uh, it worked out, but also thanks to the imagery that was created of Congo as this sort of wide free space for any external intervener to just come and uh, and serve themselves and, 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 and make the rules in absence of, um, of Congolese people making their own rules uh, back in the days. Um, that imagery um, and the way that also Congo and Congolese have been depicted as um, as either clueless victims or savage villains has um, has justified um, enormously like the continuing exploitation of of Congo as a whole far beyond uh, armed conflict uh, in in the east um, and that holds true as much for for copper um, it, it is a little bit the same for for cobalt today. Um, now we may go into the rabbit hole um, uh, looking at uh, different minerals that you find in the east and that have also played a, a quite important role, at least in, um, in some periods of the conflict. Um, but I think it's, it's important to sort of um, um, first state that when we're talking about cobalt today, we're not necessarily talking about the conflict that happens in eastern DRC because it's, uh, it's not the same story. So what is the mineral or other factors that is causing the conflict in the Eastern DRC? So I would say uh, maybe Jason may, may jump in and, and, and correct me on, on some counts. Um, if you look at things 
chronologically, um, there's no minerals that have triggered conflict in Eastern Congo. So um, we've uh, we've already heard uh, 1996, which uh, sort of was the beginning of the the regional wars um, that um, that sort of um, affected uh, well almost all of the country until 2003. Um, what happened before, um, and I'll just sort of name two peculiar events. Um, so you've got, as a consequence of um, of this sort of crumbling Mobutu regime, um, and also a lot of sort of um, divide and rule politics that that uh, that Mobutu played until the early nineties. Um, you got a series of sort of smaller localized conflicts with uh, militias building up here and there, um, starting in different places of Eastern Congo in the nineties. Uh, many of them with roots in sort of colonial ethnic politics and communities sort of being played out against each other, um, and that. Uh, into actual violence in 93 and just one year later um you've got the effects of the um the genocide that um that extremist hutu conducted against uh, the tutsi population rwanda um sort of flowing in to something that was already a very sort of volatile partly violent situation um and the first moment where sort of minerals came to play in this whole story was um, over five years later, it was about 1999, uh, where we have the earliest reports of um, minerals such as tantalum, um, tin and tungsten being uh, used by um, by the belligerents of that period um, in order to uh, finance the war effort. So let's put a pin in that. Let's say minerals don't come on the scene until the late 90s. I guess my my problem, my frustration, my confusion is often that we're talking about, we're using words like, uh, you know, colonial, regional conflict that grows and builds into a certain point. It's exacerbated by Houthis uh, uh, Houthis coming from, sorry, I'm (laughs) messing up my conflict. Houthis um, coming uh, from Rwanda in the wake of the genocide there that is exacerbating the conflict. But there's this big, it's the why of it all. Do you understand? I, I do feel like people are failing to really invest and understand because random groups of people, because of quote unquote colonial resentments, having conflict with each other is a difficult story, I think, for people to wrap their heads around. I, I do think to the extent that the mineral story is highlighted, it's because at least the kind of play for resources feels more digestible. So what am I missing about why it is that there is this persistent, even before the minerals seem to be coming onto the equation, a persistent kind of simmering um, conflict that's happening in the region? And why is it that the um, arrival of the Hutus exacerbates it? Jason, I'll I'll let you maybe jump in. All right, yeah. Well, I don't think there's one answer. This is a real frustration. I mean, you speak, we speak with journalists all the time and there's a real, you know, I, you point out that, well, why is, why are, I remember back in 2019, 20, 2018, I tracked how many times Syria was on the front page of the New York Times and it was there all the time, 270 times. And the Congo was there three times and it was one story about mountain gorillas and one about George Clooney and I think one about conflict minerals even though displacement was at similar levels. And if you speak with journalists, you know, I think many of them are very well intentioned, but they're like, it's exactly what you just said. How the hell am I supposed to tell the story? It's just too complicated. It's a hundred different armed groups. There's no clear narrative. It's not goodbye, good guys, bad guys, two groups. It's not Houthis versus other people. You know, it's, it's not a clear dichotomy. It's not even a clear trichotomy or whatever you want. But I'm okay okay with it being diffuse and not binary, but just understanding some of the motivations of the players so in the mix, so I think is helpful. So I think so after Mobutu, the fall of Mobutu in 1997 and the arrival of a new government and then the new government fell out with his former allies. And the story played out, I told before, and then you have this grand conclusion in 2003, right? The region, the region split. In the Second Congo War, the eastern Africa region, so Uganda, Burundi and Rwanda backed rebels 
whereas the Southern Africa region, Namibia, Angola, Zimbabwe, backed the government in Kinshasa. And then they fought for can five you, can years. Can you just speak to briefly what the nature of the split is? Why why would the East, that Eastern African cohort um, choose to side with rebels as opposed to the Kinshasa government? I think it's a, a variety. It's, it's I think it's largely geopolitics. I mean, at that point, you had I mean the Eastern Congo, the Eastern African countries, the the three neighboring countries that I just mentioned, Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi, all have, and that actually this persists until today and gets back to what Christoph was talking about. But they all have various interests in the borderlands area, right? The Eastern Congo is an area into which have been you know into which these countries have have been entwined in terms of personal relations, in terms of business, in terms of commerce, but also in particular in terms of security for decades. So Eastern Congo hosts Burundian rebels that attack Burundi. They host Rwandan rebels. They host Ugandan rebels. But they also host, you know, billions in terms of worth of exports. Today, for example, and this gets to the current uh, situation, the largest export of each of those three countries is gold. From East, and that most of it, we presume, comes from the Eastern Congo, is smuggled there. In Uganda, I think uh, last year, it, can, it made up over 50% of all exports, more than coffee, more than tea, more than anything else, of Uganda's export was gold from the Eastern Congo. Rwanda was around a third and Burundi was around a third as well, right? And so it just shows you these, these countries are deeply tied and invested in for a variety of reasons. And so during the Great Congo Wars, Initially, as Christoph pointed out, security was the main motive, motivating factor. And then at some point, it became a mix of different things, right? Whereas for the, East, for the Southern African countries, it was also security. Angola had rebels. Jonas Savimbi, who was trying to overthrow the government in Angola, uh, was based in the Congo. Uh, and the Angolans, the Angolans had rebels they were fighting in the enclave of Kabinda. So there were deep security investments there. Um, Robert Mugabe was of, of, from Zimbabwe, was deeply invested in the Congo for a host of reasons. Some of them Pan-Africanism, but some of them also, I think, pretty... Um, base opportunism. There was a lot of shady business deals that happened between the Zimbabweans and the Congolese. You know, this host of resources, everybody's interested in this. Uh, and so I think there's a variety of different motives that split the country, split the continent down the middle. They fought for five years. And then you had this grand peace deal in 2003 that created the Third Republic, a new constitution and democratic institutions, and also changed it, the battlefield from a purely military battlefield to a political battlefield, because since then we've had regular elections in the Congo. And the conflict has been displaced from a, con- a countrywide phenomenon to a largely located in the mountainous east, roughly the size of California, which is where most of the fighting currently currently happens. And so if you ask, well, why does it continue in the east? What's going on? I think it's it gets to a variety of different things. I think one of the things, and this has been a characteristic of the Congo since independence, since pre-independence, is weakness. The state is weak. And the state's not, not just weak because of some accident of nature, or because the Congolese don't know how to rule or because of X, Y, and Z. It's, it's weak, I think, on it's there's a purposiveness that's it's, you know, it's like, you know, it's the function of the state to be weak. It benefits many different parties to have to have a weak state. It, be, it benefits to be uh, to be blunt, also many international partners. You know, if the Congo is sits down at the table with Glencore, the largest mining company in the world that has some of the largest copper mines in the world world in the Congo, Glencore has an operating budget that's larger than the operating budget of the Congolese country. And so for them to sit down with Glencore, they're in a position of weakness when they do that, much like with the Chinese. The Chinese now control a majority of mining assets in the DRC. The the Congolese are weak. It's hard for them to stand up to many other people. Likewise, in the East, if the Congolese have a weak state administration, there's a reason all this gold flows out to neighboring countries. It's not just, you know, there are no, the Rwandan army is not in the East digging minerals and exporting them. These are traders who smuggle it across the border and export it from Rwanda because there's less harassment, because, and because of course, Rwanda also has maintained those networks because instability serves a purpose. So I think one of the key things to understand is that weakness is not an accident of nature. Weakness is something that was concocted for a purpose and that benefits many throughout this region. So that's sort of, I think, just the contextual background feature of this entire conflict. Why do you have a hundred different armed actors there? How can that possibly be? Well, the one 
actor that is all of these conflicts have in common is the Congolese state. And so that has allowed this. It's not a vacuum, but it's a permissiveness of us weak state infrastructure that allows for these, I think, local conflicts to blossom and to pop up. And then they latch on to things like ethnicity. They latch on to things like natural resources. But there's nothing inherent in either ethnicity or natural resources that should lead to conflict. It's because I think that weak state then allows parasitic opportunistic actors to jump up, international local actors to jump up and and foment conflict. So for me, if you want, in a very abstract way, that's that's why. And I can get if we can get, of course, into the nitty gritty of how the conflict has proceeded and what today specific actors are fighting about. But for me, that's how I understand it. That's helpful. And I do think we should get into the contemporary conflict and maybe do so by starting to talk about the scale of it and why why people should be paying attention, why people might be surprised because of the scale that it hasn't received as much um, attention. Uh, maybe I'll come back to you, Christoph. Yeah. So um, one of the problems um, in getting attention for Congo is is not only that it's considered still by by most of the world as something fairly peripheral, fairly uh, remote and far away, but it's also been except for occasional instances where where violence flares up in a, in a in a much more spectacular way it's been a very very slow conflict so um so you've had um i've, I've seen some figures uh, re- being reported from gaza about like uh, uh, many ten, tens of thousands of of civilian victims uh, over just a couple of months um that is rather rare in Congo, if you, especially if you look in the last uh, 10, 20 years. So there is, um, there is a much more sort of um, slow violence going on. You won't. Uh, there is probably since over 30 years, there is not one day where there is not um, um, a number of people being uh, being killed uh, by either directly by by um, by conflict parties, by armed people, um, or indirectly, because people also, um, if we, for instance, if we speak about these sort of rather infamous statistics about six, eight, or ten millions of people being uh, being killed uh, in the last 30 years. That refers to um, a one of the few sort of public attempts at statistics that have been um, made by the International Rescue Committee, uh, an American um, uh, humanitarian organization. Already, I think, 15 years ago, they spoke about like six million. Um, and that was taken up uh, in the media as if there was um, sort of a mass scale slaughter every day going on. But that was just sort of an extrapolated number, not just of battle death, but also of um, secondary victims of the conflict, which uh, whose number is probably much more important because um, the biggest so the biggest crisis we see, um, especially now with uh, with the peak of seven million displaced people, um, but also um, since many years, is the sort of not so direct effects of conflict and of violence, and that is displacement. Displacement comes with um, the impossibility of um, managing your harvest. Uh, large parts of the population in Eastern Congo are, are farmers. They live out of what the land produces, um, and if you have to, if you have to move, uh, you will not only lose your farms, but you will have to think yourself uh, what you're going to eat. Um, there is um, when there is displacement, when there is violence, there is um, a huge pressure on um, the local health system. Which uh, is uh, struggling even in normal times to um, to um, offer um, good and, um, and and regular healthcare to to citizens, and so on and so forth. And so there is just also hundreds thousands of people who who die without being shot at, but who die because um, because they lack uh, they lack a healthy environment that uh, in, uh, in which they can live a decent life. Um, and I think this is also shows a little bit sort of this intractable character of a conflict that flares up here and there that is never always the same conflict. Uh, sometimes you have hot spots of violence of displacement in sort of the far northeast of, of, of Congo. Sometimes it goes uh, more to, to southern eastern regions and all of that, that um, across this, this kind of um, region that is at least as, uh, as big as California, as Jason said. And that makes it very difficult, sort of, to um, to 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 create a narrative 
also to a wider public that is that is precise, that is factual, um, and that is still sort of powerful enough to to um to sort of raise emotions in in, in this emotional economy that we're living in. Well, I think the other issue is it, it does the way it's being described is so diffuse that it's not entirely clear to me what kind of you know interventions, be it um, diplomatic, United Nations, um, uh, kind of these kind of consumerist movements to keep your cell phone longer and you know try to put pressure on uh, uh, try to uh, on the kind of the resource demand. Um, what effect that could actually have on this fighting, which I still, I confess, I'm, it's, it's just seems so opaque. So, I mean, maybe Jason, you can, can, can connect the dots between the, you know, the nature, you know, the, the, the seven, the six or seven million internally displaced, the fighting and what is what that looks like and how that's happening. Okay. So I think the, I, I, perhaps what you're pointing to and what the listeners deserve is maybe an actual understanding of what's happening right now on the ground in the Congo and how we got to here. So if I can try, and it's a complex, but I'll try to simplify in the nature of, of, uh, of, of comprehension. So as I said, the two great Congo wars were fought, I think, between relatively discrete known actors. The first one was the region ganging up against Mobutu, kicking him out. The second was, was the region splitting and then splitting the Congo between their proxies and fighting it out. And then you had this peace deal in 2003 that created the Third Republic, that created these democratic institutions that unified the whole country, that took all of those different belligerents and put them into a national army, into a national police and demobilized a whole chunk of them. That was the first great peace process that was shepherded through by the United Nations in particular with its then peacekeeping mission, Monarch. Um, and then led to the first democratic elections in 2006. Now, the seeds of out of this out of that peace deal came the seeds of a new conflict, which we are sort of still living through now. And what happened was that the the peace process, that peace process did not satisfy all of the former belligerents for various reasons. You know, I remember visiting some of these belligerents in the field at the time and they'd line them up on, you know, they'd line up officers and soldiers on a football pitch and there would be three times more officers and soldiers. And the Congolese army officers that I'd be together with were shaking their head, be like, this is never going to go well because what's going to happen? We're going to create an army of 60 percent senior officers and no soldiers. I mean, that's and so you ended up with an army of generals in which you can't share power amongst everybody. There was only a certain number of positions to go around. Many and many of these people were illiterate or haven't gone, hadn't had formal military training. And so one of the discontents of that process were people who just didn't get what they wanted in the peace process. They defected, they went back into the field. Uh, and th- the logic of armed violence is often identitarian. So these they often recruit along ethnic lines. So they went back and they started their own little militia groups. In Eastern Congo, they're called mostly Mai Mai, or they used to be called Mai Mai, uh, of various different natures. So that's one group that went back to fighting. The second group, and the most powerful one, the vestiges of which are with us today, um, is our, was the former rebellion backed by Rwanda, then called the RCD. Um, but the, the RCD during the sec- Great Congo War, the Second Congo War, controlled around a third of the country and a third of the most precious, valuable part of the country, including the eastern, uh, all of the east, much Kisangani, Goma, Bukavu. They went from controlling a third of the country, and in, the, in 2006 elections, they won 4% representation in national institutions. It didn't take a rocket science to figure out that they were the most powerful belligerent being reduced to almost nothing in terms of power was going to be a problem. And so plan B, I mean, literally plan B, this is what they spoke of, was we're going to start a rebellion. And so they started a new rebellion basically to conquer back militarily what they couldn't get politically. And that then was led by a guy called Lohan Kunda, was the CNDP, and then the successor movement of the CNDP is the M23. And the M23 today, again, still backed by Rwanda, is that second group of discontents of the peace process that continues to mobilize in the Eastern Congo today, but with very, in contrast with the first group that really has just a local ethnic basis, the M23 also has a lo- local identitarian basis, the Congolese Tutsi community, but has very, very powerful backing from at least one neighboring country, Rwanda. And then I think the third group that's involved, I mean, certainly involved probably the most important group is the Congolese army itself. 
Um, and the bizarre thing is, is that one of a Congolese described the Congolese army as an autoimmune disease, in a sense it fights itself. It, it sometimes the, the greatest logistician of armed groups in the Eastern Congo is the Congolese army. They're fighting the Congolese army with weapons that they get from the Congolese army because they buy them off the black market because a corrupt officer gives them, sells them to them. But the Congolese army itself has become um, an extremely, uh, I, would, I think corrupt is the wrong word. It's a, it's a force that has become invested in conflict itself. It is difficult to benefit and to enrich yourself and to profit and to survive within the Congolese army in the absence of conflict. And so the way the Congolese army run, and, and the president himself has called, said this, he's called his own army a mafia. He said there's a problem, there's a, and the defense minister said it very recently, that we, our, our army is run by a mafia. And so the third big actor, also a result of this peace deal, was that the Congolese government at some point after the peace deal decided that it was going to be less dangerous for them to have a very weak and fragmented army because they were afraid that that new army was going to overthrow them, then it would be to have a disciplinarian, meritocratic, efficient army. And so they created and forged a weak army. And so here, are the, those are the main three actors that currently today play a role. Now, the, the M23 crisis, now we've gone through several generations of this ronin backed rebellion in the Eastern Congo. And that the most recent one started in November of 2021. It's called the M23. They are fighting for a variety of reasons. There's local reasons. Uh, linked to their ethnic group, the Congolese Tutsi group. They feel that they're endangered. But I think the most important reason is that Rwanda is trying to protect its interests in the DRC, a variety of ones, security, but also economic interests. That's that's one cluster of, 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 uh, of developments we've had. It's about 1.8 million of that 7 million figure of IDPs. And, and certainly the conflict that most alarms diplomats, most alarms the Congolese government, in part because it has such big backing from a neighbor and in part because it threatens major trade hubs like Goma, which is one of the largest towns in the eastern Congo. But it's not the deadliest conflict necessarily. You have armed groups further to, to the north, I think that Christoph alluded to, in the Ituri province that include, for example, both foreign armed groups. You have ADF, which is an Islamist group from neighboring Uganda that's extremely violent and extremely brutal, uses brutality uh, almost in a spectacular sort of fashion, uh, butchering and killing and decapitating their victims sometimes um, as a way of recruiting new recruits in Islamist networks across Central and East Africa. But you also have local armed groups such as Kodeko, uh, which has also been very brutal. And that's then embroiled in a very local conflict between various different ethnic groups um, in the Ituri province. But again, across the board, one of the main, the common denominators of all these conflicts is the Congolese state that has been completely incapable of, of reckoning with this. And the last thing I'll say is just because I started with the peace process that sort of brought this situation about what we haven't had since 2006, since that great peace process brought, you know, created the Third Republic and democratic institutions, we haven't had a peace process. And so we're in this paradoxical situation where IDPs are going up, number of armed groups are going up. And yet the international community, the Congolese government says this is low grade violence. This is not a civil war, nothing that would merit political engagement and a political process. So we have we've had one of the largest UN peacekeeping missions there, but it's not a peacekeeping mission that is at least in a systematic way involved in you know, negotiation between governments and armed groups dealing with the root causes of the conflict, be it truth and reconciliation, which has never really been, be it land uh, conflict, where there's never really been grappling with land, because land is the main resource in the Eastern Eastern DRC, um, never grappling with uh, demo, the demobilization process is, is moribund and defunct. So I think that the, the the shocking thing for me, you get back to how this connects to the, the rest of the outside world, is that you know the outsiders have not been figured out a way to express solidarity with this. The diplomats, the UN peacekeeping mission that's actually invested an enormous amount in this region hasn't also, they're a totally marginal figure, even though they spend a billion dollars a year on the peacekeeping mission, they've become very, very marginal in this process. And so we have escalating conflicts. We have these various clusters. We have a Congolese state that doesn't really care. We have neighboring countries that are deep Deeply, deeply involved, including Rwanda, that receives enormous support from the international community. So you have this weird situation where the Rwandan government, the largest African contributor to peacekeepers in UN peacekeepers, is fighting peacekeepers in the Eastern Congo and is still receiving enormous amounts of donor aid 
for its own government, the same donors who are spending hundreds of millions of dollars on a humanitarian crisis, in part caused by that same Rwandan government in the Eastern Congo. So there's an enormous number of paradoxes. And the only way you can make sense of, well, how on the earth can we allow these paradoxes and these contradictions to persist? The only conclusion one can possibly come to is that we just don't care enough. We just don't give a damn. It just never percolates to high enough level to be able to say, okay, we need to get on the, you know, we need to, what happened under Barack Obama is that eventually had to get on the phone with the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, and say enough is enough, this has to stop. That sort of thing only happens very, very rarely in the Eastern Congo. And you have this cluster of contradictions that just persists. I mean, when you describe um, the army as, or, you know, say the, the president, prime minister, I'm sorry, has described the president has described the army as a as a mafia. And you tell this, you know, kind of vivid anecdote about there being an army of generals. It does seem to suggest that the only avenues for upward mobilization are through the military. You know, that that kind of scrambling and scraping and fighting for status within the military, I do wonder what that would look like or what, whether or not that effect would be lessened. The, the incentive to join one of these militia groups and to use violence as a means to have uh, access to land or the, some of these other issues that you said were never resolved after the peace process does seem to speak to a perhaps a lack of other kinds of structural societal opportunities for personal advancement. And I don't know if that sounds deeply naive, but I do find myself thinking about the resource point. It, it is it does seem odd for there to be uh, a corporation that has more value than the country itself operating within a country separate and apart from a surge of violence that's happening apparently on the other side seems quite convenient, frankly, but none of that violence seems to be implicating where all of the, re the, the genuine, the core of the resources seem to be. It, it, do, I, do I have that wrong? And am I wrong to be thinking about what role a more equitable distribution of the resources and investment of those resources in the state would play in disincentivizing some of this violence? I think if if I could, I'd love to hear Christoph's thought on this as well. But if, if I two points on this, first of all, I think I've given the wrong impression here in terms of the only forces in society. I mean, one of the the most beautiful forces in Congolese society is is this extremely vibrant, whether you want to call it civil society or social movements or just the people, <laughs> you know. Um, during, for example, you know, um, democracy has not provided a whole lot to Congolese people. Parliament is notoriously corrupt and slow and does not provide much oversight. And the government is probably similar. And yet it, we've now been through uh, four different rounds of national elections since 2006, in which people are extremely committed to this thing called democracy that hasn't given them very much. Committed to such a degree that in 2016, when the current, the president at the time, Joseph Kabila, tried to change the constitution as all, almost all of his neighboring countries have so he could stay in power longer, the people rose up. And they rose up in extremely brave uh, fashion, led by the Catholic Church and social movements, radical priests at the walking barefoot with uh, crucifixes out of Sunday mass. Um, and they were then tear gas and beaten and shot out in, in the sacristies of churches. And they marched and they, and they, and they succeeded. Joseph Kubila was not able to change the constitution. He was forced to hold elections and it was literally millions of people mobilizing across the street. So there is, there is pushback. There is a very firm moral compass. I think many Congolese have, this is, it's not just a politics that's dominated by corrupt elites. There is definitely space. They, they haven't figured out. So they were able to push back against Kabila. They haven't figured out how to channel those same energies to, for example, hold the army accountable and reform the army. So that's the but first that's, thing. That's I would, what I'm getting. Yeah. Right. That's what I'm getting at. Not, you know, nothing I said, I think was a commentary on the people, but about the lack of opportunities to right. your point that democracy is offering them outside of this mafia of a military structure, which does seem to be at least affording some people some opportunities for personal gain. Yeah. I mean, the second point I would make, I mean, yes and no. I mean, the democracy takes a long time, I think, to, to really take a hold. Politics is deeply corrupt. The political system is deeply corrupt. There are too many 
political parties in the Congo. Fragmentation is a real problem in the Congo. There are hundreds of political parties. In, in the current National Assembly, I think there's 70 different parties that are present. It's difficult to mobilize as an opposition force as to do anything, whether you want to reform the country from inside or as from the opposition in such a scene of fragmentation. So fragmentation, I think, is a real problem. Political parties themselves are largely personality-driven, not ideas-driven. There's very little policy debate. Uh, so I think that there's a, a problem in terms of political mobilization writ large. But just to get to your second point um, about, about resources and the role that plays, I think this is something we just need to keep on reiterating and reiterating and reiterating. The Congolese budget today, okay, we're now heading to a place where they're finally over about over $10 billion. You know, I work at New York University. New York University's budget is larger than the Congolese budget. Hmm. This is nuts. I mean, how on earth yeah. can the, in the Congo, there's a million, hundred million people live in the Congo. And you have a un, American university with a budget larger than the Congolese budget. It just shouldn't be, especially a Congolese government that is a larger producer of cobalt in the world and the largest producer of copper in Africa. And that gets to the point that you very well raised, which is there is an international political economy problem here. It's not just the Congo. Many countries have this problem, which is that it is still so many years after 1885, when it was created for by a Belgian king to extract raw materials, it is still a place of the extraction of raw materials that go elsewhere, mostly East Asia, to be refined and then turned into electronics and other things that end up in consumer markets. And there is a no, very, 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 very little value that is added in the Congo, and much of the wealth is then fleeced by corrupt, corrupt Congolese politicians. And you know, uh, these, these multinational corporations and then sent elsewhere, thanks to offshores and uh, tax havens, this of international financial architecture makes, makes, makes possible. So there is, there are many places where international complicity plays a role in this architecture of weakness that I just described and that would militate for us to be in solidarity with the Congo. But unfortunately, it's not an easy narrative to spin to get the average American really deeply invested in this and I'll shut up. Okay, let me let me let me hit you with this. And I I want to hear from you, Christoph. Because to me, I, I'm gonna be I want to be transparent about the narrative that I want to con, con, construct in my head, regardless of whether or not it's accurate. You can tell you can tell me if it's accurate. The narrative I find myself wanting to spin to make sense of this is to say you have a national budget that, to your point, is $10 billion, a pittance when you compare it to even large universities in the United States of America. You have Mobutu dying with, what, like $5 billion of net worth. And there's this, apparently this crumbling castle that is like a, a monument to all of his uh, uh, corruption and lar largesse. And you have, what was the value of the cobalt factory? You said like many billions of dollars. Um that happens to be the largest, uh, manu you know, um, minor, uh, minor uh, extractor of this very valuable technology resource that's been used in all of our phones and all of our computers and all of our electric cars. And it's absolutely necessary for the world to move into the quote unquote modern age. Um, but none of those resources seem to be staying in the United States of America. Uh, or, sorry, <laughs> staying in the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The, the, the narrative I want to construct is one where a movement to force the, or to have a kind of a, a national or public ownership of those kinds of resources and, and a shift away from the extractive history of Congo that's dated back into the 19th century is one that's directly related to a deflation of the violence. And, but it seems I'm, I'm feeling you. I'm hearing you resist me trying to tie that together. And I'm curious as to why. And maybe, Christoph, you can pop in here as well. That the, 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 my, 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 my narrative says all the problems will be solved if we um, appropriate these cobalt mines. And by we, I mean they, obviously. And are able to use it to enrich the economy, build infrastructure, build hospitals and schools, provide paths to life and, 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 and um, professional ambition outside of feeling like you are going to be forced into internal displacement or have to be plucked to be a child soldier or all these other kinds of things that are happening. How, why, why is that naive and or impossible or kind of missing the point? I mean, first of all, that that sounds pretty much uh, um, like what what 
Congo deserves uh, um, in the short run as much in the long, as in the long run. I'll try to complicate things a little bit further, perhaps. Um, I think there is not just one reason why that just can't really happen right now. Um, I think uh, I'll maybe a, a couple of points. So, um, so going back to sort of this perhaps unholy alliance of um, of Congolese regional rulers um, not doing the job um, to 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 make sure that uh, that their populations are doing better and having a lot of outside people. Um, whether it's uh, the US, whether it's China, whether it's Belgium, whether it's many other powers, whether it's the, the private corporate sector sort of playing along. Um, and that has led to a situation where obviously we have that easy imagery um, that is also a bit colonial um, um, as a footnote, perhaps to sort of point at, at, um, at a figure like Mobutu, who had might have um, stolen more cash than than he left uh, in, the, in the in the government coffers while while he was in power. Now um, now one problem here is is that um, if there is one perhaps sort of difference in how people steal, how people pillage um, the wealth of others, is that obviously in a context uh, such as the the Congolese or or Zaire for that matter, um, as the country was called. Um, um, under Mobutu, um, things have been very much in the open and things are very personalized. Now, all the pillaging that is going on um, from abroad is very anonymized. Um, you don't have a Glencore CEO or um, uh, like sort of uh, publicly boasting about like how much dividends he made uh, over the over the past years. Um, you have political systems, especially sort of in, in, in major global powers, where a, a President Biden, um, for a number of reasons, is just not able and maybe also not willing to sort of amass billions into his into his private uh, pockets. That that doesn't lessen responsibility, though. Um, and so I think this kind of, even though it, it reflects differently in terms of um, public appearance, um, um, Congolese leaders and foreign, private, and political actors have been very much um, together in like sort of um, keeping that status quo of um, wealth and money and resources flowing out of the country for uh, for times immem- immemorial. Um, now, um, how to stop that? Um, that it's not enough to sort of actually sort of transform sort of a facade democracy with uh, elections every couple of years in the Congo into uh, into uh, something uh, more solid. Um, and maybe that's not even possible because um, if you look back at sort of this transition process that Jason um, talked about before that sort of brought about the first democratic elections in 2006 and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and all the other uh, ballots ever since, um, that was not a system intended necessarily to create a proper um, homegrown uh, democracy. It was basically sort of a standard international recipe that was very much in vogue uh, um, since uh, since the end of the Cold War to sort of um, solve every conflict by sort of setting up something that uh, resembles elections in a much more sort of uh, um, ceremonial way sometimes. Um, because in the end... Um, what I think many also of the international interveners, uh, whether it's the UN or whether it's um, bilateral diplomatic uh, partners, didn't really want to understand um, and hadn't learned perhaps from their own experiences is that um, the election, an election is not the beginning of a democracy. It's sort of the very final outcome of a democratic process that that has never happened in Congo because uh, because elections were sort of tabled very quickly after after the the wars and um but then before before i or all of us go into sort of also too much congo analyzing that that may also um kind of paint a little bit of um of a too shady picture of what what congo is um i'll just perhaps make one comment if we talk about um, political problems, security problems, if you talk about the fact that you've got militias emerging, killing people and so on, uh, maybe it's important to sort of uh, remind all of us and also the people um, um, listening and joining that 
we have very similar situations elsewhere in the world. We just don't call them like this. You've got uh, the United States is a, is a perfect example of how um, how sort of sovereign security domestically has been outsourced to sort of private uh, corporations. Prisons are run by private entities. Um, mm-hmm. You've got a lot of uh, sort of um, police forces, sheriffs and so on that are not government forces. Um, and you've got a lot of homicides and killings. Um, I'm not sure if you sort of would compare uh, sort of average daily killings uh, randomly in the U.S. compared to Congo, whether you would get to so many different numbers. So, um, so that is just uh, not not to not to sort of blame um, the U.S.'s own domestic security problems, but just sort of a l- little bit get a balancing view in all this, and we could um, conjugate that across also economic and political and other spheres to sort of make also Congo a little bit less exotic or exceptional, because as much as um, unspeakable violence is happening in the Congo, I think we've got enough examples all across uh, so-called authoritarian, so-called democratic and and many other nations in the world. Um, and, um, And I think what matters is to sort of really make the effort to sort of understand the political essence of of the of the problems because if one thing if if sort of public discourse is missing out on one big thing on Congo and other crises is that to sort of really dig into the politics of it um rather than um sort of surfing on um on things that can be trendy on TikTok. Well, that's what I'm curious about, the politics of it, though, because I'm I'm encouraged when you say that they're um, the, the people are very invested in the elections and that they marched and protested and defeated attempts to quash their, you know, hard, hard won democracy. Um, and you say that there's this uh, you describe an interest is as a, 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 an interest in politics that's so overwhelming that there's like a thousand political parties. And I get that some of that is um, kind of ethnic, ethnic and factional. And, and I, I heard you describe it or one of you describe it as um, less about um, political ideas as kind of ethnicities and and things like that. But still, I mean, that's that's a kind of an interesting energy that I'm curious about whether it's tapped into and whether or not, I mean, it cannot be that there is no kind of political discussion, no potential for alliance around a kind of positive vision for what the country could deliver in terms of more economic prosperity for the people who are living there, especially when it's just such a resource resource rich country. That's why I keep coming back to it. I mean, there are places where the struggle is different, right? Um, We've been talking so much about Gaza, which is a place that has been deliberately, you know, thwarted by a walled prison where commerce cannot happen and wells are filled with water and olive trees are cut down and the ability for people to do trade and make money is being deliberately thwarted by an unoccupying country of Israel. And so I'm, I'm just interested in this different dynamic where there's there's this bizarre mismatch between resources and accessibility to those resources, progress in terms of being farther al- along the line of having a democracy and institutions that are at least in some ways that are, are functional, opportunities for people to assert in a ballot booth a different kind of a political organization. And yet what seems to be this kind of stymied situation of a kind of self-feeding, militarized like an environment and I, I'm trying to understand and untangle like what what domestically maybe this is the way I, I'll ask it what domestically is being discussed as potential exciting avenues to the future regardless of how likely they are because I could sit here and say yes we have a left in America uh, we wanted there to be Bernie they shut that down but like that was the idea for the last you know six seven eight nine ten years of our political discussion if somebody asked me what people were hopeful about in America I would say well it's not looking great but here's what it was at least in some point in the recent past or there's some people who will argue, well, we're hoping that if we elect X many more Democrats or X many more progressives, then then we can get these kinds of basic reforms that they have in, you know, 
Sweden or whatever. So I, I just do wonder if there's a version of, you know, what is on the near horizon? What are people hopeful about? What are the kind of international or domestic interventions that would start to make that future seem more possible? Not who are we rooting for, perhaps, because there's no good guys and bad guys, but what are we rooting for? And, and I'll, I know that we're up against our hour, so I will I'm promise I'm wrapping up here. If, yeah, so I think these are really great questions. I think these are questions. I mean, I don't speak for all Congolese, and I think many Congolese would have different answers about to that question. But I think it's um, we're in a moment of great flux in the Congo. For a while, the political imaginary, you know, what is what does it mean to get free in the Congo, was clear. It was an end to foreign occupation, right? It was an end to the war, and for and war was seen as something brought by foreigners, especially Rwandans and Ugandans. And once they left, once Congolese were able to figure out things amongst themselves, that was what getting free meant, largely speaking. Um, and then the peace deal happened and war became much more amorphous sort of thing. And getting free became much different. It became a reality that politics is actually, you know, the enemy is us to a certain extent, like our own politics is dirty and we can't seem to reform that. And so getting free is, is I think, a, a, a much more, I mean, the political utopias are very different depending on which Congolese you talk to. We did a poll recently in the Congo. Uh, we do them often. We sort of track, you know, the popularity of different foreign countries. And throughout the peace process, Westerners were fairly popular in part because they were f- fueling the peace process. And so usually at the top of the list were you know, the U.S. and Belgium and France. It were quite seen quite favorably by most Congolese. And then the last two or three years, there's been this radical transformation. And the country that came out on top was Russia. Now, Russia has no involvement in the Congo, almost whatsoever. They're, they don't do anything there. There are no mercenaries. Russian, there are mercenaries, but they're just not Russian. Wagner's not there. Um, and so why, it's this notion that we're, we're fed up with what we with the formal sort of liberal Western model of getting out of this mess. We need a different sort of way of doing this. And Russia somehow, I think for some people, represented that in some sort of utopic sort of fashion. There is no, I love your idea of taking control of their own natural resources, national. I mean, Mobutu did this from the Belgians back. It's one thing he did. I think that was quite successful. He nationalized all of the copper and cobalt mines. He nationalized everything. Then he just ran it into the ground, right? And so I think that um, I really like the idea of Congolese being able to take control of that. I think the problem then is they need to take control of that and then make sure that the new national mining company or whatever it is doesn't become like the army or doesn't become like all these other institutions that are very poorly run and actually serve only the interests of a very, very narrow uh, elite. Um, but most, Con- I think many Congolese would disagree with that. Many Congolese, certainly the predominant approach amongst the political class is they want to have a broadly liberal mining model, uh, sort of clinging to the mining law that was given to them by the World Bank in 2002, right? During the peace process, the World Bank came in and helped them write the mining law. And the mining law called for the, na- the liberalization and privatization of mining. In fact, all the industries now, electricity is being liberalized, water is being liberalized. So it's a broadly neoliberal model across across the across the country. Um, and, Why is that seen as preferable? Gonna, my son is going to come and help me give a, a final analysis here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I think that, the, that the, what I'm trying to say is that there is no one political utopia here that people actually agree on. But I do agree, and I'll end on that. That what people like us who are not Congolese should be asking themselves is. What are progressive forces in the country look like? How can we f- identify those energies from down below and express solidarity with those? Because I don't believe in this providential Congolese figure that's going to save everybody. What is providential, I think, is this 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 inspiring energy of, of forces that we've seen pop up time and time again. It's a real constant in Congolese history is mobilization from the grassroots. We saw it during the colonial period. We saw it during the Mobutu period. And we've seen it since And yes, they don't always seem to have a coherent and consistent ideology and vision of where to go, but they are extremely brave, extremely inspiring. And I think that's where our solidarity uh, needs to go. All right. Christoph, any last words from you? Can't add much to this, except that I think um, we need we need to see just uh, a massive investment in, in education and that is not just about about the money I think it's about uh, it's about the the willingness like uh, of 
of both government of other stakeholders to sort of um, make sure that um, sort of a a country that that has well where education has been disrupted in many places at many different times, but where in the very beginning um, we've had a, a model and that maybe closing gap between the present and 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 the broader history where um where um. In colonial times, the objective was to keep a population stupid um, um, and to, in order to better control and exploit them. And I think that's a model that has um, that has in part survived. And and so so I think this kind of mobilization from below that is needed to actually sort of uh, bring about some some more more substantial change can only work through um, through critical and, and progressive education, um, especially going back also to, uh, you got school books in Congo today where you still, people still have to learn something about Belgian kings and about like Cold War fights between the Soviet Union and the US. Um, and there's so many, like there's, there's not just Patrice Lumumba, there's a lot of unknown, unsung Congolese heroes and heroines um, that um, that I think um, that can give, um, give an example to, to future generations. Yeah, I confess, as a black American who has like 10 age cohorts all named Lumumba, (laughs) that's part of my bias here and part of my interest, right? There is this kind of pan-African narrative that seems exciting and enticing. It makes me feel invested in it and wanting to do an episode like this, um, even if it's romanticized in the way that my lovely people frequently uh, romanticize some of these sorts of things. Um, I, I own that as part of my attraction to learning more here. And the fact that I, you know, I, I grew up in East Africa and I, um, you know, I had classmates in the 90s who were, you know, refugees from Rwanda. And I felt very proximate to some of those conflicts as they were unfolding in an interpersonal way. And I have felt my own neglect of this issue and I have felt guilty about it. And this will be just the first of a number of episodes getting into this more deeply. But I appreciate both of you dealing with me and my parochial questions here and helping to walk me baby steps through um, baby's, baby's first DRC lesson. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much. Um, do you want to tell the audience where they can find you um, online and any other projects, books, articles, et cetera, that you're working on or have published recently? Both Christoph and I have published books recently. So maybe check that that out. Christoph published a fantastic book called uh, Conflict Minerals Incorporated. Maybe I'll give a plug for his book um, that you can find, I think, uh, anywhere. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Christoph. Uh, so you can find me on Twitter at Jason K. Stearns and um, and we, at the Ebuteli, which is the research institute that we both are affiliated with in Kinshasa, is just ebuteli.ebuteli.org. Uh, and the Congo Research Group is in New York University. And Jason, are you going to say the name of your book too? <laughs> the name of my book is The the War That Doesn't Say Its Name. That uh, came out about the same time as Christoph's uh, book and also available anywhere one can buy books. Terrific. I encourage everyone to check those out. I definitely need to do some reading up myself, obviously. And I appreciate your time and the audience's time. As always, take care of yourselves and keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.